Thank you, Brian, and the team for leading us this morning. My name is Kyle. I'm the pastor here, and if we've not met, I would love to take a moment after service to say hello to you, welcome you to, to Boulder Mountain. If you're watching online, thanks for tuning in. If you're ever in the Northeast Mesa area, we'd welcome you to show up and be here in person. We'd love to meet you as well. We are in a series on the book of Acts, the beginning of the church, the Acts of the church, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and then you come to the book of Acts. So if you have a Bible, you can turn to the book of Acts or you can pull it up on your screen or follow along, Acts chapter 2. We're looking at the values of the church. A couple weeks ago, we talked about the church being a movement. The church is a movement that you and I get to be a part of. It's not a building that you come and sit in. It's a movement that we're a part of. Last week, we looked at the birth of the church. And if you missed, you can go online and, and watch that message. This morning, we're looking at the values of the church. Of Acts 2, verses 42 through 47. And before we read the text, a question for you. Who are your closest friends? Are they followers of Jesus? Who, who are the people that you connect with, maybe even on a, a daily basis? The other question I have, there's two types of people in the room today. There are those who are people people and those who are not people people. I won't have you raise your hands. <laughs> but some of us are energized by being around people. We... We're the first one to show up at the group event, the party. Where's the party? What time is it? I'll be there. And the rest of us would much rather go home, sit alone on the couch, turn on Netflix, veg for a few hours. We're energized by being alone as opposed by being with people. People are a, a big deal. And the involvement of people in your life, it's a big deal. In fact, the first crisis in the Bible very first crisis in the Bible. Now, for some of us in the room, we may think of sin entering the world and is the first crisis in the Bible. It's not accurate. The first crisis in the Bible is when God saw that Adam was alone. He said, this is not good. Because you and I, if you're taking notes, you and I were meant for community. You and I were meant to do life with other people. We're better together. You and I were made for, to do life more than just by myself. Naturally, you and I, naturally, we move toward isolation. The first thought when there's a problem in our life is, I'm, I'm just I'm not going to share this with anybody. I'm going to keep it to myself. I'm not going to share my problems with anybody. I, I don't want to be a burden to anybody. I don't want to share that I need help. I don't want to ask for help. I don't want to ask for directions. I, I'll figure it out on my own. And yet God says, no, we were, we were made for community. We were, he never says, all you need is me. Sometimes you know, we think all we need is our relationship with God. God never says that. God says you need me and you need other people in your life. It's really important. Are you a people person? Or not? Well, the command and the teaching is for all of us in the room, wherever you land on that side of the question. The teaching today is for all of us. And the teaching today is for your good. Acts 2, 42 through 47. Last week, we looked at the birth of the church. 3,000 people said yes to Jesus. And then what do they do? Yeah, that, it was it's worth celebrating. Acts chapter 2, what do they do after they give their life to Jesus? Acts chapter 2, verse 42. And they, who's they? Those who just gave their life to Jesus. They're not all from Jerusalem. They're not all Jews or Greeks from Jerusalem. They're from all over the world is they. They're from all over the world. They're there. They speak different languages. They're from different cultures or different ethnic groups, different socioeconomic status. They're all there, and they devoted. What do you devote yourself to? Sociologists are saying today that the next generation, they're less committed, less devoted 
Maybe we know some people that that's been the case. Maybe that's been the case for some of us in, in the room. We're, we're less committed to that job or we, we show up late, we leave early, we're not as committed. Well, I would make the argument they're not less committed, they're not less devoted, they're just devoted to other things. And sometimes I'm more devoted to myself than to anything else in my life. That's going to show up in every area of my life. Does this make sense? We're, we're all devoted to something. What are you devoted to? It says this group of people, different group of people from all over the place, they devoted themselves to what? To the apostles' teaching. To the teaching. This is called the ministry of the word, the apostles' teaching. Now, they didn't have a Bible like you and I have today. So what were they, what was the apostles' teaching? It was some of the gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were being circulated at this time. They had some of the Old Testament passages. They would read those. They would talk about those. Apostles' teaching. And the fellowship. What's fellowship look like? It's they liked each other. They were friends with each other. It's possible to have friends in, in the church. The fellowship. They spent time together. They hung out together. They did some of the things that Jesus did with his disciples, with his small group. He went hiking together. They went boating together. They went fishing together. They camped out on the beach. They walked many, many miles together. They didn't just sit in the temple, but they, they hung out together. They rubbed shoulders with each other. They fellowship. So as we read through this, I ask myself, am I devoted to the apostles' teaching? Am I devoted to friendships? Am I devoted to fellowship? Are, are you devoted to fellowship? Are you devoted to the breaking of bread? Now, I think we got that down pretty well at Boulder Mountain. We do pretty well with eating. Nobody's laughing at that. <laughs> oh, thank you. We, we do pretty well with that. We, it seems like we always have food when we gather together. But actually, it's saying, in the Greek, it talks about the breaking of bread, the Lord's Supper. So they would celebrate, they would recognize the Lord's Supper when they would gather together, both in the temple and and in homes as well. And what else were they devoted to? Praying. They were devoted to praying. Verse 43, And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. Now I think about that. They had all things in common. Really? You get two people together in a room, and you can pretty quick find out all the things they don't have in common, right? They'll either self-identify that. You get two people chatting online, you'll see real quick that they don't agree on, on things. These are people from different nations, spoke different languages, different races, different ethnicities. What do you mean they had all things in common? When Jesus is your common denominator, you have all things in common. When when followers of Jesus gather together and open up God's word, they're devoted to the apostles' teaching. They're devoted to fellowship. and friend. They have all things in common. Jesus is the common denominator. When we gather here this morning, we come from different places and we have different careers and different families and different experiences. But the common denominator here this morning is our relationship with Jesus. Jesus is the common denominator. You cannot have unresolved conflict when Jesus is the common denominator. They had all things in common when Jesus is the common denominator. Does this make sense? Jesus was the focus. Jesus was the foundation. They had all things in common. What else was happening? Verse 45. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need talked about the ministry of the word. When we gather together as followers of Jesus, there's a ministry of word that happens. When, when you open up God's word, whether you're in a coffee shop or in a living room or here at church or in another location with another person, there's something mysterious that happens. There's a supernatural power that brings encouragement and conviction at times, support to those who are hearing God's word. Why? Because Jesus is the word of God. Jesus is present 
when two or more are gathered together and God's word is opened up and you're sitting around, you're talking about God's word, there's a supernatural power that's happening in that conversation. The ministry of the word. And then you see in this passage, there's a ministry of deed. Not just ministry of the word, very, very important. A small group at Boulder Mountain is a group of friendships meeting together on a regular basis, centered on God's word. But the ministry of deed is, as we meet and as I hear my friend across the table has a need, the group responds to meet that need. That's what the ministry of deed is. It's not enough to just be aware of that need. It's hard. I'll be the first one to tell you, I really have a hard time asking for help. It's a confession from me to you today. I'll show up and help anybody move. It's part of the pastor job requirements, like bottom of the list, help people move. But when I move, I think, I got this. I'll do this by myself. It's hard to ask for help. But when there's a need in the group, in the small group, in your community of friends and followers of Jesus, small groups can meet that need. This is the first picture of a small group. And they were selling their possessions and belongings, distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. In January at Boulder Mountain, we started a fund. It's on our website. You can give to it. It's called the Care Fund. 100% of the money is given to the care fund go to meet the needs of our local body. That's someone who needs help with rent, utilities, their water bill, they need food. It's my conviction no one in the church who's a part of this church family should ever go in need. So we have the care fund. And $8,000 has been given to that and has gone out to to meet needs. So thank you for your generosity in that. In the future, yeah, that's worth celebrating. There's, there's a process for that, and if you're in need, let me, it, it, it's hard to ask for help. It may be you today, it may be me tomorrow, but we're to meet each other's needs as those needs, needs come up. We're to lean on each other. We're to be better together. There's a process to go about that, but reach out to your church body to, to meet needs, to meet needs of the community. When calls come into the church in the future, one of the questions we're going to ask is, is your small group aware of your need? M- meaning, have you shared this with the people that you're doing life with together? 150 people at Boulder Mountain, I, I can't know you intimately, all of you, and all the needs, but can six or eight people know you really, really well? Yes. It's called a small group. It's called a small group Bible study, life group, care group, Call it what you want, but it's a group of fellowship. It's friendships. You're meeting together on a regular, consistent basis, not when you feel like it. I'm part of some groups, and let me be honest with you, many times I don't want to go to my group. I think of all the things and reasons why I shouldn't go to my group. I'm too busy. I'm too tired. I have other things to do. There's somebody there I don't like. It's just be easier to take a night off. There's times I don't want to go. There's times I want to lean toward isolation, lean toward being alone, do my own thing, rather than lean into community and lean into relationships. But let me tell you, I never think that when I'm leaving. I, I never regret going. I never regret having been with other followers of Jesus in fellowship breaking bread together in prayer and in meeting needs. Small groups. And day by day, attending the temple together. Where are they going? They're attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes. They got together every day. These people liked each other. Every day. It wasn't, you see how in our culture, it's, it's like an hour a week. I'm going to go, I'll say hi to some people for a little bit. We'll have a cup of coffee, go to service, and then we see you next week. Every day, they were connecting, sharing, they were fellowshipping, right? 
to fellowship with people means you got to have friendships with other people. For some of us in the church, the, the word friendship has become so foreign. We have a lot of acquaintances. So a lot of people we might know. Oh, yeah, we have Facebook friends. We're the most connected culture in the history of the world technologically. But I would make the case to you we're the most disconnected relationally. And everywhere we go, in every environment that we go, outside of the church community, we have to act a certain way. We have to put, our, put a face on. We have to give a resume. We have to prove that we're worth being in that community. There's, there's action, there's work that requires us to be part of that group or that community or that job. But the church is unique. The church community is it's different. Day by day, they met together. And they met in their homes. A little vision here, Colt, right now at Boulder Mountain, most of our groups are here at the church campus. So we don't have many, but we have a few, and they, they meet here at the church. Uh, our young adults group meets at my home on Sunday evenings at 5 o'clock, but I would love in the future that most of our groups are meeting in living rooms here in Northeast Mesa. So people are opening up their home and saying, yeah, let's come, come gather, break bread together, and Eventually, we'd have close friendships where you can put your feet on their coffee table. We all need a friend where we can go to their home and put our feet on their coffee table. And if they're a really good friend, we take our shoes off and then put our feet on their coffee table. Do you have that type of friendship? Can you? Sometimes my wife doesn't even let me do that in my own home. Those are the types of friendships God desires for you and I to have. Close friendships, where you don't need to act a certain way. You can be yourself. You can be you. Sharing your weaknesses, sharing your struggles, sharing your challenges with another group of people. And they won't judge you. They won't walk out on you. They won't leave you. To be known and to be fully loved at the same time. I believe the world longs for that type of community. The world outside longs to be known fully and completely. Do you have a friend in your life who knows you fully and completely and loves you just the same? Throughout my ministry years, uh, many, many times I've had uh, I'll meet with guys. I'm like, hey, tell me about your friends. I don't have any. One of Jesus' greatest miracles, many would say, is that he had 12, he was a middle-aged man and he had 12 friends. And you say that's his greatest miracle because it's so rare. It breaks my heart. This is not just a, a world problem. This is in the church. We put on a good face and we shake hands and we greet each other and then we go through our week and we, we haven't really shared openly and honestly what's going on. I've been in Bible studies where I know this couple's marriage has completely fallen apart. Their life's a complete mess, but there was a 60-minute lecture on God's word. They prayed and they went home and nobody shared. Nobody opened up and shared what was going on. This is a group gathering, transparent, authentic, a safe place where you can share what's happening in your life. You can be known and loved perfectly. Known and loved perfectly. And in that context where God's word is taught, the ministry of the word, and the ministry of deed and love and action, wraps their arms around this person. Sometimes it's me, sometimes it might, might be you. And day by day, as this happened, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. When something is really good in your life, if you've experienced something completely beautiful, amazing, what do you do with that? You share it. You, you share it. And the beauty of that is, and the joy of that is made complete when it's shared. 
when there's something really good that's happened in your life, maybe a need was met by a friend, something really beautiful. This is an incredibly beautiful passage of just, it's not perfect community because there's people involved, but close to perfect, close to perfection. This is beautiful. And they were sharing this. And what's happening, the, the Romans are looking at this and they're growing suspicious because the only time in Roman era, they, there was sex and there was religions that would pop up and, and they had pagan gods that they would go to the temple and worship. But nobody belonged to the temple. They would go and visit the temple. Nobody was a member. They, they would show up for festivals and holidays and they'd go about. You, you were not part of a community. And then this, this group, followers of Jesus, began living a different way, completely different way. And the Romans became very suspicious because any time a group gathered, it was usually to overthrow the government, a revolt, or a coup attempt. And so you wonder why the church was so persecuted early on. Well, they were gathering together, and the Romans were like, what's, what's up with these people? We've never seen anything like this before. This is the first time in the history of the world where a group of people come together. And it's not based upon their gender. It's not based upon their socioeconomic status. It's not based upon their race. It's not based upon their language. It says slaves and free men, Scythians and Greeks and barbarians and Jews, men and women, circumcised and uncircumcised, Jews and Gentiles, all come together and they all get along. Do you, do you see the radical nature of this new way, this new community of people coming together? Because they, they had all things in common because they had a relationship with Jesus. Jesus changes everything. For the first time ever, they come together. And the gospel is shared. What's the gospel? The gospel says no matter who you are, or what you've done, or what's been done to you, God loves you and has a plan for your life. No matter what's happened to you, no matter where you come from, no matter your experiences, no matter the regrets you've had in your life or mistakes or choices that you've made, regardless of that, where you are today, God sees you and loves you and cares for you. That's attractive to a world that's dying, longing to be known, longing to be fully loved. Glad and generous hearts, praising God, having favor with all the people. As a result of that, the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. So they go from 3,000. A couple chapters later, there's two more thousand that are added. And all through the book of Acts, you can read through the book of Acts and underline circle all the times so people are continually being added. And eventually, they start to disperse. And 2,000 years later, you have the Roman government, and you had this group of people less than 1% that added up to be less than 1%. That was a minority that were being persecuted. Which one lasts today? The Roman government's long gone. The Church of, Church of Jesus is still on the offensive, is still on the move, Jesus is adding to his body daily. Every day, people are being added to his body. This is community. This is fellowship. This is what, what I desire for you. This is what God desires for you, that you would have a group of people in your life that you can rely on, that you can call up in the middle of the night, that you can lean on, that you can do life with. Because here's the reality. As your pastor... I'll know some of you better than others. I, I hope to know all of you. But I can't have coffee with all of you every week. A few of you, yes. But I can't disciple you. Disciple making is up close and personal over a long period of time. It's with a group of two or three people. When it comes to disciple making, less is more. You, you, nobody can disciple 50 people. 
I can't disciple a whole church. Hopefully today is encouraging to you. It's the teaching of God's word. You leave with new information. You leave having met with God here today. But what God wants for you is more than an hour a week. And so the challenge and the charge for all of us is that we would be in an environment with a, f- a few close friends. A few close friends. Because life change happens in circles more than it happens in rows. We're all sitting in rows today. But in my life, most of the significant life change that has happened did not happen sitting in a sermon. It was rubbing shoulders with a few people who challenged me and loved me, encouraged me over many years. That's what God wants for you. He wants you to not do life alone. We're all dangerous when we're by ourselves. Bad things usually happen with our door shut in the dark by by ourselves. We begin hearing voices of things that are not true of us. It is good for me to be in a group of people. Even if the people who are in my group, who I may not be best friends with. We all have maybe been in a small group or around people who are annoying. That's okay. Press into that. Some of us are saying, well, I've tried small groups and I didn't like the people in my group. Yeah, we don't get that choice. We don't get to choose our best friends in our small group. Lean into that. That person needs you in that group. You have something to offer in that group that that makes that group better because you're there. Better together within the church context. I I need that person. I go to group because I need to be ministered to. And when someone's sharing and talking, I'm encouraged by what God's doing in this person's life. A small group, or what does a small group look like? Jesus had 12 disciples he met with on a regular basis. If he had 12, I don't think any of us in the room should have more than 12 in our small group. I've seen groups get to be like 15, 20 people. Yeah, not healthy. But what does it look like to have a group of six people, eight people? You care for each other. You pray together. You share needs with each other. You you open up God's word. We have a men's group on Tuesday mornings. There's maybe six, seven, eight of us. We share our lives with each other. We pray for each other. We're on a text thread. Here's the reality. For a church our size, there should be more opportunities. And so we're launching small groups here at Boulder Mountain on Tuesday night, October 3rd. For six weeks, you'll come here to the church, meet some people, connect with a few people around a table, get to know some people, open up God's word, get to know what are their needs. And then from there... At the end of those six weeks, our prayer is that you'd be able to launch into a living room, living room, move from the temple to a home. We get some small groups going. And that every night of the week, there'd be a different small group happening. I've been encouraged to be in some small groups through the course of my life. God's been really good to me. I've, I've, my wife and I have been so blessed by being with some different groups. And most of the time, they're not groups I would have chosen. Like, yeah, that's probably not the, if I were to handpick my small group, it's not probably who would... Been so, we've had grandparents that we've learned from. We've had people a couple steps farther in our, our journey, our marriage journey and our parenting journey than we've been in. The very first small group experience I was a part of was our youth group when I was in high school. It might have been the world's smallest youth group. There were five of us. One of them was my sister. Our leader was named Kurt. Kurt was a volunteer youth leader, and we met every Wednesday night. We got together. I'm so grateful for Kurt. I don't remember any of the lessons that he ever taught me. But I remember that he showed up every Wednesday night. I'm the cool one in the middle in the denim cutoff shorts. Your middle. Uh, Kurt is on the left, your left, far left, back in the short, short era. Really short shorts there. Kurt rented a van, took us to Tijuana, Mexico. I grew up in Pleasant Valley, Iowa. And we... We drove to Mexico because he thought we needed to experience a mission trip. And this was our ragtag group. I'm still close to those two guys there. Not as close to my sister, but no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> close to her as well. But this was our youth group. We met, met, all, met every Wednesday night. I'm so grateful for, for Kurt. 
I got to know what a small group community looks like. We, we went, we tore up the van in Tijuana, and he had to buy the van, even though he rented it for the week. We did so much damage to that van, he had to buy it when he drove it back to Iowa. But this was our first experience. So we've had a couple other experiences, um, some lifelong friends. We were in a small group for 10 years. With some, I could call them in the middle of the night. Whatever you need. Do you have the whatever you need people in your life? The early church did. Whatever they need. Whatever they need. A couple other pictures of our, I think there's another small group. Uh, this was a small group. We went to Mexico. We went to Rocky Point. Our small group and the kids, we took, went down there for a weekend and we served together. Small group, you have fun together, you, you cry together, you laugh together. You, you're you not going to know everybody when you come into the church on a Sunday morning. But, but what would it look like in your life if you knew four or five people really well? And they knew you really, really well. They loved you so much. They know everything about you, and they still loved you. They're still in your life. Life change happens best in circles, not just in rows. A number of years ago, I got a call. Uh, I was at another church, and uh, it was late at night, and I got a call that uh, the sheriff's department. Now, as a pastor, when the sheriff's department calls, it's not usually a good call. And a young man had passed away. Uh, he was killed on a motorcycle accident on the 60. And so uh, I drove right to Chandler Regional Hospital, got there as fast as I could. And I walk into the ER room, and over in the corner, I see a group of people gathered together. And the couple had lost their son in a motorcycle accident. The whole small group had beat me to the hospital, praying over this couple, crying together. Do you have somebody who's going to meet you at the ER today if something were to happen? God wants that for you. He wants your closest friends to be in the church that you can pray with, that you laugh with. You gotta have fun. Jesus had he had fun. Friends with the disciples. They did some stuff together. Do you have that? This this group from what was described in Acts 2, change the world. God was adding to their number on a daily basis. Every day, God was adding to their number. It was attractive to the watching world. The world would, would look like there's something different with this group of people. They like each other. They're meeting needs. They're selling stuff. Some of us are worshiping the things we should be selling to be able to meet needs. So we're going to have a hard time letting go of those things. They were devoted. The question I personally this week wrestled with, am I devoted all in on this, on this movement, the greatest movement the world has ever seen, the greatest movement the world has ever known, continues to move forward. It's on the offensive. And so in order to be on the offensive, I'm going to ask you to do something. Are you willing to, to sign up for, for a group like I just described. Be willing to, to try a small group. We have a few existing groups, a men's and women's group. We have a young adult group. We have a few groups happening in the church already. But on that Tuesday night, October 3rd, just sign up or be willing to commit to six weeks to show up, meet a few people, and see what God does. But in order to be on the offensive, that means we have to do some things we've never done before. We have to to sign up. It's going to be scary. It's going to be risky. I don't know whose table I'm going to be put at, right? These are all the questions I'm thinking. But lean into that. Don't buy the lie that you can do life on your own. That, that comes from Satan. You're, you're, you're fine. You don't need anybody. You're too busy. You're too tired. You got enough going on. Listen, when, when you really experience true community in your life, you realize you can't afford not to. What did I do before I had friends? So lean into that, whatever that looks like. Maybe for some of you, you're like, I'm going to start a group. 
I'd love to have that conversation with you, what that would, what that would look like. Women, there's a group on Wednesdays currently, on Wednesdays, 10 to noon. There's a group Tuesday mornings for men at Black Rock Coffee Shop. But there's more opportunities. We're going to have more opportunities in the future. Who's your small group? Who's, your sm who's gonna show up at the ER when you're in need? Who can you cry with today? Who can you call up and laugh with today? Don't do life alone. And so, Father God, we thank you for this passage in Acts chapter 2, describing the early church to us. Thank you for this beautiful picture. And we know there was, there was a mess because it involved people. Not everything there was perfect, but there was community and there was fellowship and there was food and prayer and the teaching of your word. And I pray that, Holy Spirit, you would encourage us to take a next step, whatever that might be, whatever that looks like, that we wouldn't buy the lie that we can do life on our own and that we would lean in toward the relationships and friendships that you so desire for us to have. I pray for those groups on October 3rd that will begin. I pray, God, you begin to establish those friendships even now people who have not ever met before, you would do a work there. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for this, this group here, this ecclesia, this church community. So grateful for the people in this room, the people at Boulder Mountain, for their friendship, for their fellowship. Grateful for their prayers. I'm grateful for the way they meet needs. Pray that our need meeting would move from this church into the community and continue to meet needs. It'd be so attractive to a world that's dying and lost, and hopeless. We'd so welcome them in, Father. We ask this in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'm so glad that you joined us for today's service. Let me leave you with a few next steps that you can take. Number one, let us know that you're participating online. You can make a comment there in the notes. You can send me an email or you can give the church a call. Just let us know. We'd love to add you to our email list that updates our people on what is happening in the life of the church. Number two, if there's something I can specifically be praying for you about, I can give that prayer request. I will pray for you, but I can also give that to our prayer team. A third next step that you can take, if you've been encouraged by the ministry of Boulder Mountain, even though you've maybe never been here physically, uh, let me encourage you to give. We believe that giving teaches us contentment. When we recognize that God's been generous to us, so at Boulder Mountain, we give first, we save second, then we live on the rest. So there's an opportunity for you to participate in giving through our church website. If there's anything else that I can be doing for you or, or Boulder Mountain can do for you by sending you resources, simply let us know. Otherwise, let me pray for you as we close our service. And so for those, Father, who are not here in the room, we recognize church is not a building we come and sit in. So wherever they are at, we know and we believe that, Jesus, you are with them. So I pray that they would sense your presence and your power. Holy Spirit, give them the wisdom to know what to do and then give them the courage to do it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you this week.